Good afternoon. A warm welcome to all of you to the launch of the IIEA publication, Europe's Digital Future, Perspectives from Northern Europe. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the digital group here at the IIEA. Today's event marks the launch of the first joint report by leading uh, national think tanks and universities, which explores perspectives on digital sovereignty from Denmark, Estonia, Ireland, the Netherlands and Sweden. Let me first welcome very warmly and introduce to you our five authors, authors who will present the findings of the research from their member states perspective. From Denmark, Jan Ho Smith, senior advisor and think tank from Think Tank Europa. From Estonia, Dr. Adrian Venables, senior researcher from the Tallinn University of Technology. From Ireland, Seamus Allen, digital researcher at the IIEA. From the Netherlands, Dr. Brigitte Decker, researcher at the Klingendal Institute. And from Sweden, Gunnar Hopmark, chairperson, Stockholm Free Worlds uh, Forum. I'm delighted to see you all again, and we look forward to your presentations. Andrew Gil, uh, Gilmore, Deputy Director of Research and myself, have edited the report. Each author will present the key findings of their papers for approximately five minutes, and then I will go to you, our audience, for questions and answers. As you know, you'll be able to join our discussion by using the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Please feel free to send in your questions during the presentations and also to use Twitter and our Twitter handle is at IIEA. I will come to you once the speakers have finished their presentations and that is all the speakers. We'll give, have the five speakers speak one after another. Today's presentation as, as usual uh, and the question and answers is on the record. The European Commission's president, Ursula von der Leyen, describes digital sovereignty as the capability that Europe must have to make its own choices based on its own values, respecting its own rules. Yet it has become an unclear concept. What is clear, however, is that the issue of digital sovereignty is one that could have far reaching consequences for the EU Despite this to date, it has garnered only limited debate at national level in many EU member states. This is the fifth event of a year long IIEA project entitled Dig Europe's Digital Future, supported by Google, which is exploring the topic of digital sovereignty in Europe, what this concept means and what future it might hurl for EU <laughs> and for small open economies like Ireland. The views expressed in this event and in the associated publications are those of the authors alone. Today, our authors will highlight the perspectives of Europe's digital front runner states, and they will assess whether and to what extent Denmark, Estonia, Ireland, the Netherlands and Sweden have national debates or strategies on the topics that are related to digital sovereignty. They will identify key issues in the debate that are particularly relevant to their member state and offer an initial, an initial assessment of the possible implications of a digitally sovereign EU. Our first speaker today and author is Jan Ho-Smith from Think Tank Europa. Jan will outline Denmark's view on the topic. He notes his country's more skeptical view of the concept of European digital sovereignty, but identifies that Denmark is amongst the top performers with respect to digital transformation, has recently launched a commission on digital partnership and identifies important digital priorities which Denmark support. Jan, over to you. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Joyce, uh, and good day to everybody uh, joining this uh, webinar. And I'm looking very much forward uh, to an interesting uh, debate uh, this afternoon. Uh, my 
main message is that the Danish government fear that an EU strategy for digital sovereignty may lead to EU protectionism and thus reduce innovation uh, in the EU. Danish politicians basically prefer an EU regulatory approach that rests on one hand on European values, traditions, but maintain an open competition uh, with the rest of the world. Now, on top of this, traditionally, the concept of sovereignty in relation to an EU political debate in Denmark usually refers to a Danish fear of losing national sovereignty uh, to the EU. So the concept of digital sovereignty is a difficult one in a Danish political uh, context. That said, the government and Danish industries and social partners broadly support the content of the EU digital compass, as well as the main line uh, in the Commission proposals on the Digital Services Act, the Digital Market Act, and uh, the proposals on the artificial uh, intelligence. Nevertheless, so far, uh, there is little public debate about the need for a strategy to speed up digital transformation of the Danish society. And probably, I mean, on the one hand, it is very much due to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, and the situation related to that, but probably also due to the fact that Denmark is already among the European uh, digital uh, leaders. Nevertheless, the government uh, has in March 2021, as you said, George, established a Danish commission with representatives from industry and uh, social partners, plus experts to work out a strategy for continued uh, Danish digital transformation. And the, the mandate for this uh, commission is broadly in line uh, with the content of the EU digital compass strategy, if you may call it that, uh, uh, without, however, making any re explicit reference to that EU strategy. And furthermore, in June 2021, the government also launched a debate on regulation of the big tech firms, drawing to a large extent on elements from the Commission's proposals on the EU uh, legislation. But as I said, not much public debate so far, uh, but there are a couple of issues worth mentioning uh, from uh, a debate amongst uh, mostly experts so far that may turn uh, to raise uh, a public debate uh, in the autumn. And the first one is the debate on the simplification of data protection. Uh, another one could be uh, a debate on the resources for the Danish Data Protection Authority. I think you have the same debate in Ireland. Uh, and of course, then uh, also a debate on an EU digital tax may come up during uh, the rest of the of 2021, uh, depending, of course, how it goes with the international discussions and the discussions in the EU. As a few sort of concluding quick remarks, let me just highlight the following. Uh, as I said, an EU strategy based upon EU digital sovereignty is not a mobilizing strategy in Denmark. Competition with the rest of uh, the world is regarded as very important for uh, continued innovation. As for regulation, this should be based upon European values as suggested in the EU strategy, but EU should still be open to negotiations with key global partners about the content of the regulation. Regulations of uh, AI, based on ex-ante risks 
should be based on clear, transparent criteria and rules, and should preferably be worked out also in collaboration with global partners. Regulation of platforms should ensure compliance with rules of content. Special rules may be envisaged for mega platforms, gatekeepers, but the rules should again apply for EU as well as non-EU uh, firms. And finally, as for the rollout of digital infrastructure and 5G, uh, it could be no worthwhile uh, noting the Danish experience, which is that in the context of the auctions uh, of licenses for radio spectrums, the government has agreed with the operators that these uh, there should be uh, specific targets for the rollout in terms of timing and in terms of percentage of the populations. And that could maybe be also uh, an element taking up uh, uh, in general. Thank you very much, George. Thank you very much, Jan Host, for that very clear presentation of the situation in Denmark. We now move to Dr. Adrian Venables, who's a senior researcher in Taltech, the Tallinn University of Technology from Estonia. Estonia is an enthusiastic proponent of digital sovereignty. Adrian highlights the positive contribution Estonia can make to the development of European digital sovereignty by drawing on Estonia's position as a leader in digitalization. He will also discuss the role of digital identity and introduce us to the concept of data embassies. Over to you, Adrian. Right, thank you very much indeed, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Adrian Venables, and although I'm talking to you from the UK now, um, I work in, uh, in Estonia at uh, the university. If we could have my first slide, please. Just to, um, uh, that's fine, that's who I am. And second slide. <clears throat> And just to avoid any any embarrassment, if anybody's unclear of their um, their northern or uh, northeastern um, Europe geography, um, there we are in the uh, in top right, just below just below Finland, and um, to the north of Latvia, bordering bordering Russia. So, having orientated ourselves, if we next move to the next slide, a little bit of background for Estonia, um, as we are not well known, um, small population of one point three million. Um, one of the least crowded countries in Europe. Over half the country is forest and bog, um, which is populated with bears, wolves, link and elk. And I'll point out at this moment that the photograph of the bear was in fact taken by me last week on holiday. Um, and this was a, a bear spotting trip, not that I randomly encountered one. Um, highest point is uh, only uh, 300 meters above sea level, so a flat country. And in Estonia and Tallinn in particular is known as the Silicon Valley of Europe. And in fact, Estonia's reputation is based upon its uh, digitalization and its um, entrepreneurship with the highest number of startups per head of the population with Estonians having invented Skype and a very technological city. Um, although um, for those who haven't yet visited Tallinn, it has also the best preserved medieval city in Northern Europe, so well worth a visit, and um, has one of the highest literacy rates in the world. And although um, Estonian as a language is um, counted as the fourth hardest language for a native English speaker to learn, um, rest assured that the Estonians are some of the best English speakers in Europe and often put me to shame. So my next slide. So looking at that, at that background, um, Estonia got its independence uh, from the Soviet Union in 1991 and went through a rapid digital transformation. So digital sovereignty is not a new concept. The country is based upon the whole um, ideas of a digital identity and public services being online. So Wired magazine in 1995 called it the world's most digital society and it still ranks as number one in the uh, European Commission's Digital Economy and Society Index. In reality, this counts for a virtually paperless government in which 
99% of transactions with the government are conducted online. So we pay our taxes online, online banking. Our bank branches do not hold cash. We vote online and we can access all our government records online, which is audited. And if I go to my government um, website, um, it will tell me who in the government has actually accessed my, my information. So it's a very open um, digital society. And this is all based upon a national identity. We all have a, um, an identity card, which we can use for legally binding digital signatures. The only things we can't do digitally are marriage and divorce and property purchases. Although um, that even is changing with the first um, elements of, of um, marriage documentation is now being carried out online. So next slide. So Estonia's digitalization um, very much starts with an education system, a population that is brought up with online schooling. Everything is based upon a, uh, an online persona and a country that has totally embraced the concept of digital, digital sovereignty. Now, my, my findings um, discovered very much that um, greater digital sovereignty will benefit Estonia. Its geography and small population is not well positioned for manufacturing within Europe but is ideal for EU-wide digital services and the digital service industry. So Estonia knows this, and so it embraces every aspect of promoting digital sovereignty within Europe for its own economic benefits. So we're looking at a concept of a digital single market, which is a digital version of the uh, single market within, within the EU, open markets, supply chains, and bringing the, uh, the continent and the EU closer together with, uh, with less um, borders and with more seamless um, digital services. And Estonia is aware that um, compared to other um, competitors such as the US and China, because of the, the nature of the EU, of a number of sovereign countries, there's a danger of falling behind against these global competitors. And so they're very keen to promote the digital sovereignty concept. So next slide, please. So one thing that Estonia is very proud of and promotes very strongly is the concept of cybersecurity. And this is obviously based upon the, um, uh, the 2007 cyber attacks, which is still fresh in the minds of uh, many Estonians, those who were quite young, quite junior in government in 2007 are now quite senior. And so um, they're very aware of the cyber attacks that, that we encountered. And, um, Estonia and Tallinn is home to the NATO um, Cyber Defence Centre of Excellence. Um, so cyber security goes hand in hand with digital sovereignty. And this is a concept which um, mustn't be forgotten. Uh, and the two very much go, go together for confidence, both for government and for populations. And linked to that is the concept of the, the digital embassy. Uh, and Estonia is the first country to have a digital embassy. Um, it's in Luxembourg. And essentially it enables all government records to be backed up outside of Estonia's borders. And this means that um, in the event of a, a catastrophic cyber attack or natural disaster, you can essentially back up and restore digital records of the country. And this is particularly important in a paperless society in which hard copies just do not exist of uh, key aspects of, of government and, uh, and personal data. Next slide, please. So um, Estonia's recovery and resilience plan, this is uh, something that, uh, that we looked at. Um, uh, and, and for those not familiar with it, this is an EU-wide plan in order to rebuild after the, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. And um, Estonia has uh, requested um, nearly a billion euros um, in, in, in grants. Um, and very much this is based upon a number of, uh, number of headings, which I've listed there. Um, the granularity of each of these subjects is, is not well defined yet. So um, these are very much sort of headline areas that Estonia would like to, would like to invest in. Um, but as I say, other countries, larger countries are more advanced in detail of how they would spend the money. At the moment, these are, these are just headline, uh, um, headline areas and, um, and a total amount that um, has roughly been divided between these, uh, these subjects. So my next slide, please. 
so, um, so on, on my conclusions, um, very much in, um, uh, in comparison to um, the Denmark, um, Estonia, one of the first nations to digitize and has really reaped the, uh, the economic and social benefits. Um, the, the population of the government has really grasped it. Essentially what it means to be Estonian is to be digital. And so there are no issues nationally or politically about increasing digital sovereignty or any of the concepts that we will discuss this afternoon. Um, Estonia still leads um, many areas within the EU in areas of digitalization, the digital identity, digital online services, um, a paperless government, um, digital signatures, um, just, just the, the sheer nature of Estonian society is digital. And as a result of this, Estonia is quite clearly a, a keen and enthusiastic EU, EU partner. We are very willing to contribute and also to lead in the areas in which we already have expertise and leadership and well-established principles and services within our society. And of course, um, as well as being quite altruistic towards uh, the EU, of the Estonians are some of the most um, um, pro-EU um, uh, EU states, um, there are great benefits that um, Estonia will gain from um, greater EU digital sovereignty, um, a, um, an EU single market, um, because with a entrepreneurial digital society, certainly Estonia sees that it will it will benefit from that in in many areas. So um, so yes, Estonia is very much in the front line. Estonia is very keen to move forward and to uh, to develop with, with the rest of the EU. And I think you'll find that's my my final slide. On to the next one, just um, yeah. So that's um, that's Estonia for you. Thank you, Joyce. Adrian, a very clear presentation of what's happening in Estonia. And uh, I like that picture of that bear, I must say, you were, you were quite close to it. Um, um, yes, they, they, they actually do put some food out for it. So it wasn't a completely random encounter. Oh, so okay. it's, it's a height and, you, and they bring food out. So, um, so yes, okay. it's, it's not tame, but it knows where to go. Nice photo all the same. Thanks, Adrian. We now move on to Ireland and Seamus Allen. Seamus is the digital researcher from the Institute of International and European Affairs here in Ireland. And Seamus will highlight how the concept of digital sovereignty has received limited attention in Irish political discourse. The concept Seamus shows may, however, have implications for many of Ireland's key interests. Over to you, Seamus. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Joyce. No, I don't have any exciting pictures of bears or anything else, unfortunately, but I'll, I'll try and have a picture of a leprechaun for the, the next time. Um, so, yeah, at the moment, there hasn't really been that much public discussion or debate in Ireland about this concept of European digital sovereignty. It's not something that Irish politicians and policymakers have really explicitly commented upon that much. Nonetheless, if you look at the European digital sovereignty agenda in Brussels, it is possible to see topics that are really important for Ireland's interests. So I think I'll start off, I'll just say a few words about Ireland's broad approach to digitalization at an EU level, and then I might hone in on three particular topics. So I'll start with cross-border data flows, secondly, Ireland's data protection role, and then I might just say a few words about this topic of a, a European digital levy. So to start off on a, on a broad level when it comes to the EU, Ireland's approach to digitalization regarding promoting it and regulating it, Ireland, like most of the other countries here, strongly supports investing and spending to promote digitalization at an EU level. Recently, the Irish Prime Minister, Taoiseach Michal Martin, actually commented that he would favour a much more expansive and ambitious European budget. With regards to Ireland's own recovery and resilience plan, about a third of all funding is being allocated to digital, so that is significantly more than the 20% required by the European Commission. Now, nonetheless, if you look at some of the specific targets in the plan, it could be queried, are some of them really that ambitious or sufficiently ambitious? In other cases, maybe some more detail needs to be fleshed out and to be revealed to see how significant they will be. When it comes to regulating digital at the EU level, Ireland, again, has quite a clear position. In general, Ireland favours a regulatory environment that it sees as being innovation friendly. It's quite concerned to prevent regulation that could be overburdensome and that could stifle innovation unnecessarily. I think this can be seen quite clearly in Ireland's submissions, say, on the Digital Services Act package on the AI white paper from last year. 
And throughout Ireland, like most of the other countries represented here, is very supportive of an open Europe and a Europe that's open to the rest of the world. So going on to the first of the topics that I mentioned, cross-border data flows. Well, personal data and the possible misuse of personal data, I think that's always been at the, the heart of this discussion of European digital sovereignty. It was what prompted it to become very prominent for the first time. And since then, the GDPR has imposed an awful lot of restrictions on the flow of personal data outside the EU to the rest of the world. For Ireland, that's especially significant because its two largest trade partners, the United Kingdom and the United States, are of course aren't in the EU. Now, up until very recently, there was the EU US Privacy Shield, which facilitated data transfers, but that was invalidated last year by the Court of Justice of the European Union. And that prompted an awful lot of uncertainty. At the moment, a lot of companies are using standard contractual clauses to continue those transfers, but this is quite legally contentious. It's being challenged. And if it were to be undermined, it could be very economically significant. With regards to the United Kingdom, at the end of last month, the European Commission finalised a data adequacy decision for the UK, which will enable free flows of data. However, there was some pushback from the European Parliament, from the European Data Protection Supervisor. As a result of that, there's a number of caveats attached to this. And most importantly, if UK law changes, this decision could be reviewed and it will automatically lapse after four years. The reason that's so important is a lot of UK politicians and policymakers have talked about the possible benefits of diverging from the GDPR following Brexit. And if that were to happen significantly, it could undermine that process. Now, regarding the economic size of all this, this is something I look at more in the paper. I think there's a broad consensus that if data flows were to be very significantly disrupted, it could have quite harmful economic consequences for Europe as a whole, and particularly for Ireland. Going on to my second topic that I mentioned, so this is Ireland's data protection role. This is very closely related to the first. So Ireland is very disproportionately the home and headquarters for many multinational technology and digital companies in Europe. And under the GDPR's one-stop shop mechanism, this means that Ireland is effectively the lead regulator for these companies for their conduct right throughout Europe, not just for Irish citizens, but for European citizens as well. So even though Ireland's Data Protection Commission, the DPC, has been receiving significantly more resources in recent years, it's still be receiving a lot less than what it has been asking for. It's been pointing to this very disproportionate responsibility that it bears. And Ireland's coming under increasing attention right across Europe from privacy activists, from data protection regulators elsewhere. Some of them have been criticizing the DPC's processes, its procedures, querying if it has sufficient resources. As a result of this, the Irish Parliament and the European Parliament have both been looking into this and scrutinizing the issue. And in May, the European Parliament passed a resolution asking, asking the Commission to bring infringement proceedings against Ireland. In June, there was a very significant ruling again as a result of some of this pressure, which clarified for the first time that data protection regulators elsewhere in Europe can bring cases against companies based in Ireland under specific conditions in specific circumstances. But it's clear that there are regulators elsewhere in Europe who would be eager to do so. So it's likely that Ireland would come under increasing pressure and scrutiny in the years ahead. Going on to this topic of the European digital levy, a proposal from the Commission was due to be published this month. Now that's been postponed. It's going to be looked at again in the autumn. This was due to the ongoing OECD-led tax talks on corporate tax reform. That's also important for Ireland because it makes the background more sensitive. It's expected that Ireland will lose very significantly in corporate tax revenues. And while we don't know the specific details of what will be in this digital levy, the digital tax that was proposed by the Commission back in 2018, that was blocked by Ireland and a number of other EU member states. There was a concern that there could, Ireland could become less attractive as an investment location, that there could be a loss of corporate tax revenues. This time, there's an added concern about trade relations with the United States. So quite a number of EU member states have, at a national level, introduced digital taxes of some form or another. And the US, including under Biden, has threatened trade tariffs and retaliation, viewing these as largely affecting American firms. Now, the Digital Commissioner, Margaret Vestier, has said that this levy will actually affect hundreds of companies, that most of those companies will be European, uh, but we will need to see you know, the specific details of what is in this levy to talk more about the implications. So to wrap up, I think it's fair to say that this digital sovereignty agenda will touch on many issues that are very important for Ireland. I've outlined some areas where Ireland has strong concerns. Nonetheless, there's of course areas where Ireland is a lot more positive. I mentioned, you know, Ireland's support for ambitious spending and investment to promote digitalization. There's also digital challenges such as cybersecurity and disinformation, where Ireland has been quite vocal in saying that no member state is large enough to address the challenge by itself, that countries are, can deal with them more effectively working together. 
And to conclude, I think I think it's fair to say that Ireland needs to be very alert to this digital sovereignty agenda as it develops in the years ahead, and that it will be very important for many aspects of Irish economy and the Irish society. Thank you very much, Joyce. Thanks very much, Seamus, for that very clear presentation of what's happening in Ireland. We move next now to the Netherlands and Dr. Brigitte Decker, a researcher from the Klinegel Institute, and she will look at the prominent discussion on digital sovereignty taking place in the Netherlands, the establishment of a permanent parliamentary committee on digital affairs in 2021. And I suppose the other area that Brigitte will look at is looking at the Netherlands, trying to find a balance between stakeholders and interests concerning national security, economic security and digitalization. Brigitte sees the Netherlands playing an active role in shaping Europe's digital policies. Over to you, Brigitte. Yes, thank you so much, Joyce. Uh, it's an honor to be here today and kind of represent the Netherlands in this timely debate. Um, let me start with saying that digitalization is most of, in this, of the agenda in the Netherlands. Uh, for example, as you said, in the parliamentary elections of last March, every political party acknowledged the importance of digitalization in a broad range of topics. Um, and as you already mentioned, there was a parliamentary committee on digital affairs installed just to keep the, the parliament up to, up to date with the latest uh, digital matters. And in the Netherlands, especially when discussing the EU's international influence, digitalization is included in the debate. But in this domain, the Netherlands is still exploring its precise course of action. For example, um, the, the Netherlands digitalization strategy was adopted in 2018, uh, which was quite early compared to some other EU member states. Um, and in its reaction to the digital compass, the Netherlands welcomed, for example, the efforts made to create a digital single market and highlights the geopolitical dimension of the digitalization. But it also states that the government of the Netherlands was quite disappointed that the digital compass made no reference to the white paper on AI or the EU cybersecurity strategy, which also already um, highlights some of the key areas the Dutch uh, government is interested in. And uh, I think the key issues in the Netherlands can be summed up as follows. First, you have the ability of the government to govern national digital infrastructure. Secondly, you have the strong liberal market tradition in the Netherlands and uh, the need for regulation. And thirdly, the dominant position of foreign uh, platforms and the use of uh, citizens' data. So if we start with the first one, the national digital infrastructure, of course, I do not have to repeat the whole 5G debate that has been taking place for quite some years now. But if you look beyond this debate, one can observe that in the Netherlands, this debate can be split into two dimensions. First, you have the espionage risk of foreign entities providing the specific technological know-how. Um, and then you have on the other side, you have the financial considerations of companies. And especially the connection between those two dimensions is noteworthy because um, in the Netherlands, companies are having serious doubts of investing in um, by the government marked as trustworthy infrastructure if the price is too high. So it's not only a matter of national security for companies, it's also just a market um, that they have to adhere to. And secondly, the Netherlands has a strong liberal market tradition with little to no market interference. Economics and politics, however, have become intertwined due to the state-backed enterprises that are largely headquartered in China. And in response to some hostile mergers and acquisitions from both the US and China, uh, a new and intense debate on industrial policies have started in the Netherlands. The debate is characterized by a multi-stakeholder approach, uh, which is everything in the Netherlands, uh, with the inclusion of a more diverse uh, palette of actors, the Netherlands feels that challenges can be better identified and corresponding solutions and opportunities can be better executed as it has sufficient support and cooperation from all parties involved. But we now see that while we are super proud of our polder method, as we call it, um, the divergent interest and consensus based model can also impede now effective and decisive decision making in the digital domain, especially because it's moving forward so quickly. And lastly, the dominant position of foreign social media platforms, foreign platforms, and the use of citizens' data is becoming a subject of discussion in the Netherlands. Is there still um, a discussion that is on the rise? Uh, the, the first two elements are much more discussed in the Netherlands, 
But you see that in the Netherlands, the US business model, depending on the free flow of data, and thereby enabling companies to use large data sets to innovate, scale up, and expand their businesses, is not really um, is not complementing our view on data sharing. And on the other end of the spectrum, of course, you have China strictly regulating all data and numerous uh, popular Western platforms that are banned from state security reasons. So currently, the EU, the Netherlands, uh, we are all trying to establish a position in this debate, and we are really following the EU's way by introducing, uh, by supporting the third way the EU is now introducing. And while there's no call to ban platforms that spread illegal or harmful content in similar ways as, for example, the Chinese government do, does, there is a call for regulation within the Netherlands, um, and the intentions have been clear. Consumers need to provide consent to companies to use their data, uh, and companies need valid reasons to keep the data of uh, the personal data of consumers. And in addition to this, um, every debate states that uh, the citizens need to know that they can request, request access to the companies and it meant that your data has to be deleted if there's no necessity to keep it for their services. And in that way, uh, the Dutch debate is also about providing citizens with the right information and not just companies, so they can also have the, the individual digital sovereignty, if you like to call it that way. Um, and to give you an example of how it's now arranged, it's practically mostly focusing on companies because it has led to 12 actual fines in the Netherlands in a period from 2018 to 2020. And with an average of four fines per year, a company does not seem to run excessive risk at the moment of getting fined because they are not handling personal data of consumers the right way. So you can draw two conclusions from this number. Either companies adhere really strictly to the GDPR regulations or data of the citizens is still be for sale, to say it like that. Um, looking at the time, I will stop now. So we have some, still some time for debate, but thank you. For your excellent presentation of what's happening in the Netherlands. Now we come to our last speaker. Uh, uh, and author uh, from Sweden, Gunnar Hockmark, who's the chairperson of Stockholm Free World Forum. Gunnar presents, presents the perspective from Sweden, highlighting Sweden's preference for a Europe that is open and competitive, which does not seek to close itself off from an increasingly digital world. Thank you, Gunnar, and we look forward to your presentation. Joyce, and thanks to RIA for this event, because I think it is high time that we do discuss not only that we want to be successful, but how we get successful. Uh, everyone wants to be successful, but uh, sometimes very few discuss the choices you need to make in order to get successful. Uh, and regarding digitalization, uh, it is uh, crucial for our economies and our societies to be in the lead because otherwise it will influence our societies as a whole. Then we will be backward societies and uh, economies losing competitiveness and, and we will not be in the lead for the innovations that will mark uh, the, the defining factors in the coming decades. I, I think that how to get successful in some way, you can trace it to, to, to this discussion and uh, to the participants in it, because uh, uh, IIA, you have chosen a number of representatives from countries that are quite successful in digitalization. Uh, I, I noted um, with the joy that uh, most of our speakers uh, underlined how, how successful its country is in in this and a number of different indexes, etc. And, and I think this is the consequence of these countries and some others being, first of all, very relaxed or positive to digitalization. It has not been a discussion about how to regulate in the sense to slow down or to, 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 to avoid it. Uh, most of our countries have been uh, positive in action in order to, to enforce digitalization. And the other important parameter is, of course, our economies. And I think that is a common denominator for, for the participants and all the participating countries here is that it's a 
view on economies and open economy, open for competition and open in a global sense. That, that is quite crucial. And, and if we look upon things, uh, if you want to be a leading digital economy and le leading digital society, of course, you need to use all the things that come to you across the world. If you don't use the best technologies or the best algorithms or the best platforms or the best ways of doing whatever, you will always use the second best or maybe the third best. And then you, as a society, will not be in the lead anymore. But you will not get the dynamic development in your own society if you fence yourself off from this development. And that's why the, the item of digital sovereignty has in reality never been a discussion very much in Sweden. But, but I, I, I noted that our Estonian friend underlined the, the, the importance of digital sovereignty. And it struck me that sometimes we can mean different things with sovereignty. Uh, in Swedish, when we, you say souverain, you can mean it in two ways, either you're sovereign in the meaning independent and on your own, or that you are a leader, a sovereign player <laughs> leading the game, so to say. And I think this is the only way for us ahead to, to try to be the best and not be the best by fencing ourselves off from others. Uh, I think it is in the great nature of digitalization that is open because uh, it gives you access to knowledge, uh, new innovations, new ideas from all over the world. And it makes you rich in that sense. And if you can use that in different ways in your own society, you will be, become successful. And I think this is one of the reasons why our economies, our societies are quite successful in this area. And not forget, some others are not. And I think in Sweden, we have a rather relaxed view of this. Uh, we, we have also seen, and I think we are used to the fact that the digital development is by its own nature full of disruptive developments and, and surprises. I mean, a lot of things we do today would be seen as sci-fi 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I mean, we, we can uh, participate in a webinar like, like this, sitting in a car or walking around in the city. I mean, we wouldn't have believed that even five years ago. And the interesting thing is that in five years time, we will be just as surprised as what about has, what has happened since, since now. And this is for, for me, a defining thing and about how to be a leader, not to fence yourself off from changes, uh, developments, new innovations, take them on, bring them on. Uh, and uh, I think there is a common denominator in the Swedish strategy, sometimes outspoken and very defined, but sometimes just setting up the goals that we, 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 we need to have an extremely good infrastructure. That is broadband, that is the development of 4G and 5G to, to have the, the best possible connections. And I think what is over, has been overseen, we need also to have the highest level of digital security because the more digitalization becomes a natural part of the whole of our society, then the most strategic important it is that we have digital security. We need to enforce and enable digital innovation, but also see to that we can get more of digital management in public service and uh, wherever we are, and that individual citizens have the digital skills. This is not about fencing off. This is about enabling and securing that we have the capacities and the capabilities in Europe. And, and I think that is much more important to try to be sovereign in the way some mean. Uh, I think we shall be sovereign in the way I think we mean and our countries have experienced. Thank you very much. Very much, Gunnar, um, for showing us the Swedish uh, perspective, but also perhaps highlighting that issue about the, the concept itself of digital sovereignty, how so what sovereign means about enabling and one of the first speakers we had on this subject in this series was Roberto Viola. And um, 
he he kind of dismissed the kind of general concept or not concept definition of digital sovereignty, but said it really was about empowerment. And that's really what you're saying. It's about empowerment. But uh, thank you all very much for your excellent presentations. I think they showed the variety and the combination of combina commonalities between each country. But I think what has been really interesting for me and for I, I think for our audience has been the range of differences and yet at the end that commonality which will make us all work together for you know a better life for our own citizens but also for Europe but um, I see some questions coming in and I'm conscious of time so I'm going to go to the questions um, right away and the first question i'm going to ask you in the order that you spoke if that's okay maybe to answer this question and it says um, europe wants to uphold european values through european rules and also to make europe a digital technology leader how can europe find the right balance between regulating and promoting digital technologies where will this be particularly challenging Jan, we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, well, that's, that's a really difficult issue because finding the, the right balance uh, between, uh, let's say, being faithful to one's uh, traditions uh, and uh, values, of course, is very important, but there are always, I mean, other elements that you would have to bring in to uh, uh, to uh, this, let's say, equation uh, and this balance. Uh, so I think that that's a difficult. Uh, but I think uh, Gona's point on the capabilities is important. I mean, if if we do not have the capabilities. Uh, our values will not be the leading values in the world if we want to have that. Uh, and the other thing is uh, that we also need to bear in mind that the kind of regulation that we put on uh, industries, uh, be it uh, in the digital sector in, in the proper sense or uh, more widely, uh, in the digitalization of industries uh, needs to be as light as possible. But that doesn't prevent us from, for example, taking some uh, bold decisions on saying, okay, let's try to see whether we see X on an X and the basis, very high risk in certain areas, and then say, okay, we may have a different regulation in those areas and a, a very much lighter regulation in other areas. But it's, it's not something where you just find a blueprint uh, like this. Thanks, Jan. Um, Adrian? Yeah, I think this is a, this is a really good question and it, it gets very much at the heart of the matter. Um, I said before in a discussion with the panelists that um, the EU regulates, but other countries innovate. And regulation is, is straightforward. You, you get people together, they decide on a, on a list of, of um, constraints, restraints, and you, you enforce that. Um, the issue is how we, within the EU, innovate with the technology to promote the concepts that we want within digital sovereignty. And we need to look at where we source the technology from that we need. Are we going to create that technology within the EU, which will have longer lead times and perhaps more ex be more expensive than perhaps China, who would have the technology and will be very willing to sell us that technology now that's available at a cheap price, but brings with it security and other, and other concerns. So this is very much a, a, an issue of taking a holistic view. We need to determine the, the regulations that we need in order to maintain the, uh, the principles of the democracy and the freedoms within the EU, 
And so nations which are up to now perhaps more reticent and reluctant to embrace the concept of digital sovereignty will be reassured and brought on board, but also that we can guarantee that there will be that, uh, that security and that ownership and the control over the data of which digital sovereignty is absolutely key. So there's two elements to this question. There's the, uh, there's the regulation aspects, but also how it links in with the availability and the capability of the technology that's needed. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, Ricky, Seamus, would you like to comment? Yeah, thank you, Joe. I'll just maybe add one or two things to what was already mentioned. Um, I think Gunnar touched on something very important, actually, which is the speed of technological change. You know, we could pass a regulation today and that regulation could be out of date in five years time or 10 years time. And I guess something regulators talk an awful lot about is trying to make regulation future proof. And I think that's a, you know, an admirable goal. It's something that should be aimed at. But uh, I think some of the time uh, I would be skeptical, can we, is that something that's actually achievable? Do we need a fail safe? Because we can try to abstract away from any particular or specific technology to make something future proof, but there might always be something ahead that we just don't expect at all. That doesn't seem foreseeable. And uh, we maybe need to factor that in and think about it if it's at all possible. And there's a couple of principles that should be borne in mind. I suppose one is being future proof. One is being a risk-based approach. You know, you obviously want tougher regulations where the risks are far more serious and then focusing on what, what's reasonably foreseeable. So some comments have been made about the EU's proposals on artificial intelligence, for example, which are quite interesting, is this idea the EU's proposing regulations for a whole range of sectors where AI will be used. And yet at the minute, AI isn't being used in those sectors. And one criticism that was made is, well, how can we regulate something that you know, just isn't being used and we haven't seen it being used as of yet? And I guess the other side to that is when it comes to high risk AI, you know, it's maybe too late to wait until it's being used or until it's caused actual harm and negative consequences. So there's something you need to think about what's reasonably foreseeable, where are the risks, how do we make it proportionate? So I think it's, it's definitely a struggle and it's definitely a balancing act. And that's all I have to add on it, I think. Thanks, Seamus. Brigitte, would you like to add to that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think what's also important in this debate is what are the precise values of the European Union? What do we talk about precisely? I think between the member states, there's already a discussion just as the concept of digital sovereignty. I think between the, the member states there will also be a, a difference between what is, what is meant by human-centered or human-centric. Uh, for me and in the Netherlands, uh, it's mostly about digital innovation that works for users and consumers, uh, puts people really central in the debate, sees privacy, for example, as a primary issue, and also looks at the sustainability of a particular digital innovation, um, and that together makes human-centered. But I'm also wondering what the other member states that are present here today would feel about that. And then... Um, I think we also have to, from, from here on forward, we also have to think about the rules and being uh, a digital leader, as the rest already said. Um, indeed, I think we can try to do those things hand in hand. Uh, we need to create alternatives, innovate to compete with the US and China, not only in Europe, but also abroad, and create regulation at the same time that is also attractive to other companies and other governments and is flexible. Uh, to actually adapt to the future, um, because I only think then you can actually include innovation and regulation together in a human-centered perspective. Thanks, Brigitte. And finally, Gunnar, what do you think? Th thank you. I think there are two things we need to keep in mind. And first is that if Europe is not in the lead for the technological innovation, we will never be able to uphold European values. Then other values will dominate. Mm -hmm. uh, just make the experimental thought that uh, China had been the leading economy for the last 30 years mm -hmm. and regarding the development of internet. How would ethical and legal standards then be developed? Uh, and that is the true challenge we have in the next coming decades. We will only be able to uphold European values by being in the lead regarding innovations uh, and taking the first steps. Uh, the Chinese economy will probably be bigger, but we can be better. And that must be a fundamental clue for thought. And that is, uh, as mentioned before, we, we need to secure that we can 
regulate in the way that we innovate, not regulate in way the innovations. The yeah. second thing is we must stop talking about digitalization or the digital thing as some sector in our society. It's an integrated part of everything. It's not dramatic, it's not future. It is exactly where we are now. And that means that European values and legislation must be upheld in the same way when we speak in this forum as when we speak in, in, in a real life meeting. We, ne we need to secure, uh, Shomas mentioned it must be future proof. Mm. Uh, I, I would really like to agree on that, but I would also like to add it must be as long and as far as possible be ne technology neutral. Mm. Uh, we shall not have special regulations for the digital sector because there exists no digital sector. The digital is, is just like having special regulations for electricity. I mean, we, we do have, I mean, you, you can't have the plugs of, of different kinds if they are dangerous. But, but in Jena, we don't regulate how to use electricity. Mm. And this is wider and more and more. I mean, 3G was a development of telecom. 4G was a development of uh, integrated services. 5G is about everything. And then you can't regulate digital as it is a special thing. It is all and everything. And we need to have a neutrality recording technology. Then we can uphold European values. Conrad, thanks for that. I mean, I think increasingly all, all, all of you have raised the issue of values, uh, human centric, and also the importance of flexibility. Um, and as you've said, uh, Gunnar, being technically neutral or technologically neutral. But having said that, I wonder, um, what do you think, and I'm going to start with you with Gunnar on this, what emerging technologies or specific aspects of digitalization do you think we may currently require greater attention from policymakers than it has to date? You know, are, are we just, you know, focusing on certain types of technology like AI, obviously cybersecurity is terribly important, but are there, your point about, you know, being technologically neutral, how can we kind of look at what's coming in front of us and, and try to develop them as well? This is of course the, digital, the important and difficult thing. Uh, but, but I think it is in the zone between what we call algorithm and artificial intelligence, where the real problems and challenges will be. We need to be in the lead, but we also do need to think about how technology works in order to be technology neutral. And, and it's easy to see some areas where, where it will become extremely difficult. It has to be about uh, health and medicine and privacy. Uh, it is about how to use big data without uh, interfering with the private integrity. Uh, it is about a number of things, but, but, but I think nothing of this will have, an, we will have no leverage in nothing of this if we are not in the lead, because mm -hmm. otherwise uh, others will do what they think is the best and then we will in reality have to follow. So, so, so I think, uh, and it's easy and trivial to say, but I think it is in the boundaries between what we call algorithm and, and, and um, artificial intelligence, uh, more or less the same, of course, but, but how they are used and uh, projected in, in different areas like uh, medicine and, uh, and other things. Um, and of course, security will become so extremely important. We have seen how Chinese and uh, Russian groups linked to, to, to the states have, have done a lot of damage in the in, uh, in US and in Europe and, and uh, the more we are depending on, on the digital structures, uh, the more dangerous that will be. Thanks Gunnar and we, we have a, a question here um, which I'm, I'm going to ask you again if that's okay from Owen O'Connor from Enterprise Ireland and he says as an Irishman living in Sweden it has taken me time to get all the benefits of digital society here, as you must have a Swedish identity number first, which takes many months. In the future for this European digital society to work, 
as many other EU members have these barriers for non-natives, could it be necessary for EU citizens to skip this process or be fast-tracked when moving to other EU countries? And in a way that links to Adrian's point of our digital identity, but perhaps Gunnar, you might uh, answer that uh, in, from, from the Swedish point of view. Yes, uh, and I, I'm grateful for this question because it's uh, underlining the fact that uh, Sweden is quite successful in digitalization, but not regarding public sector. We are lagging behind them. And I, I think it's uh, uh, t terrible to him. Uh, but first of all, of course, Swedish bureaucracy in this sense needs to be better. Uh, and, and, uh, the, uh, and we are increasing the use of uh, digital structures in, in, in public sectors uh, with a very good use of, of, um, of uh, digital identity and uh, digital legitimation. Uh, and of course, the ground solution here is to have a European identity and European uh, digital legitimation. That, that would solve these problems uh, very rapidly. And I think it's quite close in time. Adrian, can I bring you in on that? And then I'll bring in Gianna Brigette and uh, Seamus. Yes, Joyce, um, as to ask this, I think Gunnar's point of the digitalization of public services within, uh, within Estonia, um, as part of the residency process, you get a identity number. Essentially, you can't do anything without this number and, and it comes with, with your residency. But even if you don't have physical residency within um, Estonia, um, the country was one of the first to bring in the concept of the e-residency. And so anybody can apply for Estonian e-residency. And, and that will actually give you this magic personal number and will enable you to digitally sign documents and be able to set up a company in Estonia from outside, outside the country. And so, um, you know, from Estonia's perspective, it's a good way of raising income because you obviously have to pay for these e-residency cards, and there's obviously some tax um, that's, uh, that comes from having companies uh, within, within the country. And so that concept of uh, making digitalization um, at the heart of society and at the heart of government services is, is that mindset. But I absolutely agree with, with Donna um, in that you need to have, um, if not a single EU identity, but have the national identity cards um, transferable and be understood. So essentially my health records in Estonia, if I'm traveling and have an accident in Spain, I can give this same card to the Spanish health authorities who will be able to access my, my health records from Estonia in Spain. Um, that is, that's really the concept, you know, the, uh, the pinnacle of digital sovereignty. But within that, you obviously have to have that security and the insurance um, and the confidence of, of the use of that data. And I noticed the, uh, the, the, the second, second question um, that's on the, uh, on the site there from Declan, where data is key. And, and, and absolutely, and it's the, um, the availability and security and integrity of that data, which is, which is at the heart of digital sovereignty. Brigitte, do you think there is, is that mindset in the Netherlands in relation to digital identity and the trust to create that one, one entry point for all data? I'm in doubt. On the one hand, I think there is. Um, we already have like a, a, a digital identity, but only for government. Um, Affairs, so we can we can see our our study or our uh, subsidies in it. Um, so that that part is arranged quite well. But everything else, it's it's still a mystery for the Netherlands. I feel we now are having discussions on the digital government um, to to update everything. But I think in this it will be key how how much we already take the European digital identity in account. Um, I think it will be key that we do not have 27 digital identities that do not connect with the European digital identity. Um, so yeah, I think if we can, if we can use that and the, the debate on, on the digital identity, the European digital identity is, is going forward now. Um, I think from the Netherlands, we, we will be all right, but we will not be the front runner in this. Uh, I think the, 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 the countries like Estonia, like Sweden will be much further ahead than us already. 
Jan, will Denmark be one of the front runners? Uh, well, that's that's a bit difficult to say. I mean, we already have a central sort of registration number and have had it for years and years and years. Uh, and it is now digitalized and we have, I mean, as I mentioned in my, my part of, of the publication, uh, we have a, a, a very high level of uh, digitalized sort of uh, transactions between the public and uh, the public sector. That said, I mean, you need to develop in the public sector further on uh, uh, how you can simplify things, especially also uh, between the public sector and small and medium sized enterprises. The other thing on the European level, I think that what the way to work forward would first of all be to have national digitalized registration numbers. Uh, and then we need to have the different systems being able to speak together. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but that requires quite a lot of security and that requires also quite a lot of political will, I'm sure, uh, of in various different, members. yeah. Seamus, how do you think we would respond to that, to having that digital identity here and also, you, you know, related to government services, but also linked in then to a European identity uh, access number, if you like? Um, well, I, I think Ireland is very supportive of completing the digital single market and like, a digital identity will be quite important for that. Um, mm -hmm. I think when it comes to the digitalization of public services, it's something Ireland is very well aware of. The Recovery and Resilience Plan actually specifically calls out digitalizing public services as one of the objectives, one of the areas where money is going to be invested. Looking at the European Commission's digital index of performance across states, when it comes to digitalization of society and digitalization of public services, it's an area where Ireland does do relatively well. And I think the Irish government wants to continue doing well there and to increase its spending there. Uh, so it's an area I think where Ireland does see benefits. And uh, just in relation to that then, just as our final question, um, how do you all assess the member states recovery and resilience plan with regard to investing in digitalization? Because you've all mentioned the importance of innovation but innovation needs resources. So how, how, what do you think about that fund? Is it as our own Taoiseach has suggested that we should go back for more if we want to really maximize the impact of digitalization? I'd like to start with you, Brigitte. Yes, thank you. Um... I'm not sure how to answer this question. I mean, on the one hand, I think it's a really, it's a really, um, uh, how do you say that? The, the recovery and resilience uh, fund is, is really needed to, to build. And I think digitalization has to be at the heart of it, but or well, at the heart of it, it has to be integrated in all parts. I, I really agree with Gunnar. It is not just the digital sphere. It's related to everything. So I think also in the recovery and resilience plan, uh, digitalization should be included in everything, mm. but not as the specific sector as a whole. Yeah, Adrian, what do you think? Um, there's been some um, some work done analysing the uh, uh, the Estonian bid, and and some has been quite critical, saying that the um, uh, the detail isn't there yet. And I think that's that's again one of the issues of a um, of, of a small country which is already fairly digitalised, looking at um, how it can best um, spend spend this money. So within the wider balance, I think digitalization is not as prominent as perhaps some other countries within the EU applying for funding. And the, uh, the Estonian government is looking for funding in other areas where, where, it, is, where it is lacking. So I, I don't think this, uh, that this fund will be of um, huge benefit to or an already digitalized country. Um, but will perhaps be used used in other in other areas. And Connor, what about Sweden? Has, has this, it has invested a lot in innovation, though, hasn't it as well as looking to this fund? No, I, I, I think the, the fund is of course important, but um, I, I want to come back and to, to and um, Brigitte came back to that as well. It's dangerous to, to say that we have some digital issues and some some other things because okay, we don't. Yeah. Things so, 
for example, all the big car manufacturers are, are going electrical, uh, more or less, uh, or totally from 2030. Uh, there will be no uh, petroleum driven cars produced in Europe after that, I think. Uh, and electrical cars are increasing. It's rather that the, the, the public sector and, and um, public infrastructures are not adapting to the pace of the development. Um, uh, we need, for example, to have uh, much higher capacities for production of uh, electrical power. Mm. Because otherwise you will not have the breakthrough for electrical cars and electric okay. trucks. Uh, you, you need to have uh, adopt legislation in order to facilitate. Uh, I can take one very concrete example to facilitate for more rapid payments. Uh, I mean, in, uh, uh, in European Parliament, I was uh, taking part in, in Cap, you come. And we changed it and forced it through. So making it possible for all the new FinTech companies to compete with the traditional banks. So, all banks were not happy about that, but all customers are quite happy. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so I think it's much more uh, adapting to the reality than trying to re regulate the reality, if you see my point. Yes. And Seamus, that point then uh, that, you know, we are uh, the digital economy, we, it is the economy, it is society. How do you react to these special funds then? Have they helped in Ireland's case, do you think? Uh, well, with regards to the, the recovery and resilience plan, I think there's kind of six or seven main objectives listed in that plan for where the money is going to go. And as I mentioned, the amount of money being allocated as a proportion of the total funding is quite significant and it's above what the Commission required. But when you look at some of the specific objectives, one is, for example, you know, ensuring schools have ICT equipment and internet connection. Obviously, that's very important. But perhaps it's something that should be seen as kind of, you know, being a bare minimum in this day and age rather than a uh, an excellent goal that we achieve and that make this society very digital. Another one then is digitalizing the census, which again is you know very important, uh, but again maybe could be seen as something that's a, a bare minimum. And then another relates to e-health, which you know again is similar, but it's going into another area. And then of course there is money about promoting digitalization more generally in the public services or uptake amongst businesses. And like Adrian mentioned, it'll be you know it'll be with regards to what's in the details of how that's going to play out. I think that's going to be very important. And Jan, I'd leave you with the final word on this, on the, the Resilience and Recovery Fund. Well, thank you very much. Let, let me say briefly three small things. First of all, in the Danish case, 25% uh, uh, is uh, in, the, in the plan, in the Danish plan is devoted to digitalization projects and, and they are spread a bit around. Uh, second point is that we should not just look at these plans. They will be important, but they are much more important for a number of countries with lesser means than, for example, Denmark, Sweden, Ireland, others. Uh, and therefore, we have to look to other parts, and that's the, uh, the third uh, issue here, uh, that is the budget in itself, uh, whether or not there is enough money for that. And then you have, of course, the discussion, should it go to the agriculture, should it go to, okay. to yes. uh, facilitate, etc. But in that context, we also need to take care of that. I mean, we need private, of course, investments also. We also need private investments to back up or uh, take the lead in certain areas, even, even in laying out uh, infrastructure. But to have that, we also need to enable private business to, for example, enter into cross-border mergers in order to have, I mean, the capacity uh, to make the investments. Thank you very much, Jan. And I'm sorry, we, we can't ha have any more questions. Declan, I see there's a question you've come in there. Well, perhaps we'll get it at another time. But thank you all very much uh, for your presentations. Adrian, Jan, Seamus, Gunnar and Brigitte, they were very, very interesting and I think created a, a picture of Europe 
and the possibilities in the future. I think you highlighted the various perspectives on digital sovereignty, digital policies, strategies, issues and challenges. But I think a number of things emerged which are really important um, about the importance of leadership and vision. If you want to be a leader, you have to be, as Gunnar has said on a few occasions, you have to be the best. You have not only to be the best, you have to have a vision to be the best. In order to be the best, you need to co compete. All of you made that point. There needs to be competition. And yet at the same time, there needs to be that openness to work with others to work with uh, the US and Seamus has raised the issue about the UK, but the importance of that transnational relationship is critical. And it seems to me that you're all saying that challenge, that balance between creating that, in a sense, competitiveness, entrepreneurship, leadership in Europe will only happen, ironically, if we compete with ourselves and with Europe. And of course, the key thing I think that's come across, and I think it's important and it's been mentioned a number of times, is that the economy isn't digital, it's the economy. We've now moved on. I think years ago, we talked about digital this and digital that, but now it's such an integral part. There's nothing in our lives that aren't impacted by digital. So I think that's really important. And the challenges ahead to, um, because the president of the commission set up very clearly at the beginning uh, of this year, two agendas, the digital agenda and the green agenda, and both the digital agenda and that sustainability agenda are going to be the dual transformers of our societies, of Europe, but of also Europe within, in an international stage. And I think, um, you know, you raised, and I know you've raised it in your papers about that link with um, uh, other countries outside Europe uh, and China, but also central, and all of you have made this, our values and the human-centric approach of Europe. All the regulations really cut through that issue about values uh, and regulations that have to take that into account. One of the things I think you've mentioned too is the importance of innovation and regulation and, and that how, how do you square those off as well, but the importance of investing resources uh, into that area. We, got, we only touched on digital tax, but the, probably that was a wise thing because conversations are still going on. Maybe the next time we meet, it might be more prevalent, but it obviously is going to have an impact on all of us uh, and obviously particularly in Ireland. But digital identity, I think that was really important that came out as a key topic. Estonia lead the way perhaps in that, but it really is through digital services, government services. So we are really uh, encouraging everybody to look at that is aspect of uh, digital identity, all the issues that go with it because it's linked to uh, data, it's linked to data protection, and it's linked to uh, privacy. But I suppose the other thing is, um, how do we foster these relationships? How do we work together on an integrated way to make ourselves leaders, global leaders, but also give that coherence to Europe? I think your papers have created an absolutely great framework to promote discussion and debate and research around this issue and learn from each other. So thank you very much for that. Um, we look forward to continuing the debate in September. So thank you all very much, um, Jan, Adrian, Seamus, Brigitte and Gunnar for your excellent presentations and for helping start this really important debate, which I think we're going to hear more of. I'd like to thank our audience for your participation today and for your questions, and we hope to see you in the autumn. And I'd like to thank our colleagues in the IIEA for the proofreading, the uh, graphic design with Emer O'Reilly and their support, and to also to Lorcan Mullally for the production side at the IIEA. And of course, thanks to Seamus and Andrew Gilmore for your work on this uh, event and report. So we wish you all a really good summer. Um, 
though it's beginning to rain here, I'm in Kerry, it's, it's raining unfortunately, but we see the sun coming up later today. So I hope you continue to take great care. See you in September and until then, have a, have a good summer and a good break. Goodbye for now, goodbye to all of you. Thank you.